One month later, the site of a crane collapse is considered too dangerous for former tenants to retrieve their belongings and even for passing traffic. We have live team coverage today on this. I team investigator Ginger Allen's digging into what happens to residents' belongings. They're waiting and wondering. But Ginger, stand by. We're going to start with JD Miles Forrest live over at the site of the collapse. Uh, the area is still blocked off, but construction on another apartment building right across the street is not being impacted. Is that correct? That appears to be the case, Doug. The crane that toppled here one month ago was being used to build that 10-story apartment building you see behind me. It collapsed onto the property owner's other occupied apartment building. Former tenants want to know why they are being kept out while construction on the new building is allowed to continue. Sunny Felipe desperately wants to get important parts of her life out of her sealed off apartment. I had everything of my life in that apartment. I had my piano. I have um, myself and my husband's memories. Rudy Hetzer just wants customers to be able to drive to his tattoo studio. Our numbers are down about 40 percent. Former tenants and nearby business owners have been severely impacted in the month since a construction crane blew over in a storm, killing a woman inside the Elon City Lights apartments. Oh my God, the crane is falling over. Oh my God. 400 once occupied apartments and the streets around the accident scene remain sealed off, and a block of Live Oak Street has been closed to passing traffic, supposedly for safety reasons. So why are construction crews allowed to continue working on the $100 million Elon City Lights Phase 2 apartment building if the sealed off area is considered too dangerous? It's a question former tenants and impacted business owners want answered. It's so frustrating. I mean, there's a crane sticking out of where they're doing construction into my old home and they're still allowed to continue when we aren't even allowed to get our things. Construction crews have even started stacking building materials on the empty street. More reason for former tenants and nearby businesses to accuse Graystar Properties of taking advantage of the situation. Now, we did not get a response from OSHA about this, but we did get one recently from Graystar. Uh, they did not address the construction issue, why it's about still going on, but they did tell us, quote, certain portions of the building and the entire parking structure, however, will remain inaccessible until OSHA and outside investigators have completed their investigations. Of course, there are hundreds of cars in the parking garage over here at Elon One, the city lights, and their apartments, 400 apartments that have uh, possessions in them that people want out. Um, obviously, they're frustrated having to wait right now a month to get their possessions. I-team investigator Ginger Allen has been looking into this. She joins us now live with more on what she's learned. Ginger. JD, as you've learned from these residents today, we have learned they really are in limbo out there, particularly with insurance issues. But we do have some answers. We have reached out to all of the authorities involved. We've talked to several different insurance companies, and we've talked to the Dep Texas Department of Insurance, which told me this morning this is a very unique situation. Those are our boxes, Pat. You can still see boxes sitting on this couple's balcony. They were three days from moving out when the crane crashed into their complex and onto Josh Gomez's new truck. The crane is literally on top of my truck. Gomez says he's still paying on his new vehicle, but the insurance company won't pay him. He says the adjuster cannot get into the garage to verify the loss, and he's not alone. Residents tell the I-team they've spent a month trying to get their lives back, trying to get their adjusters in, and worrying about insurance and financial troubles. Unfortunately, they were getting the runarounds. The I-team has learned there is a lot of finger pointing about which entity is keeping residents and adjusters out. The Department of Insurance tells us in this unique situation, no state law governs a time frame of when claims should be paid. But there is some hope. First of all, if you ever find yourself in one of these situations, we've learned that having comprehensive rather than just liability or collision coverage really helps make a difference and move this along. And then secondly, there is a place you can turn for support. So Doug Gilma, I will have more on that tonight at 10 as we continue this I-team investigation. Doug, I will see you then. Okay, we'll look forward to it, Ginger. Thank you. And tonight, we are hearing from the attorneys of the family representing Kirsten Smith, the woman killed in her apartment when the crane collapsed. The law firm saying in part, quote, we are working with OSHA to conduct our own investigation on behalf of Kirsten's family to find out why this senseless tragedy occurred. Quote, claims made by Biggie Crane and Rigging Company 
that extreme local wind conditions caused this crane accident are entirely unsupported by the evidence we have gathered to date, as the crane was supposed to withstand winds in excess of what was reported in that area.